Today we continue our sermon series, Reframing Jesus. As I've mentioned throughout this series, the title reflects the fact that John takes the gospel that is shared with us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he distills it, boils it down, and he reframes for us, narrows down to the so what of the gospel. But from another vantage point, it is Jesus who is reframing. He is reframing for the disciples what life is all about, what's important, where true greatness, glory is found. It's what we see here in the subtitle of our sermon series, Portraits of Glory from John's Gospel. In our communion meditation this morning on the first five verses, we've already seen Jesus reframe what glory looks like. According to Jesus... Glory is cruciform. It takes the shape of a cross. And so we've seen this wonderful portrait that he's given us. Now, the disciples at this point are struggling to embrace the cross as glorious. Only Jesus is able to truly understand what is going on. And so the disciples are confused about what is going to take place. See, Jesus understands that the cross is the means by which he will save us, redeem us, purchase our eternal life. Jesus even reframes eternal life for us, not as nirvana or paradise or even just heaven, but eternal life is to know God. Jesus is not preaching life hacks. He's preaching new life. His message is transformative, transforming our view of reality, our worldview. Have we seen this all throughout John's gospel? Over and over again, Jesus obliterates the disciples' view of reality and gives them a different perspective through which to see life, a perspective that sees life through the lens of the cross, through the lens of the kingdom. He challenges our biases, our assumptions. It should be no surprise then that in this final chapter in the upper room, in Jesus' final words to his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus is yet again seeking to transform, change, reframe the disciples' worldview. So how about you? Has Jesus been challenging your worldview. I suggest to you that if you haven't felt your worldview challenged throughout this series, I've not been doing my job. But I think the Holy Spirit has been doing his job in our hearts, helping us to see life from a different point of view. For those of you who've been on this journey with us for a few weeks, a few months, or even the whole 10 months, has this gospel significantly impacted your worldview. I guess it might be helpful at this point to define terms. Now, you know where I turn when I want a definition, don't you? Anyone? I go to Funk and Wagnall, because Funk and Wagnall was published in 1961 before political correctness took over. So I love to read the definitions in Funk and Wagnall. However, here's the problem. I looked up worldview in Funk and Wagnall, and guess what? It's not there. You know why? Because the word worldview was actually had been around for 100 years before Funk and Wagnall published its uh, dictionary that I have on my desk. It was around 1855 that this German word was brought into existence, Weltanschauung. How about that? Nice, nice German, huh? I hope no one speaks German here. I, I, I added the exclamation point because for some reason with German words, I feel like you need to have an exclamation point. <laughs> now, I did go on to look this up in my huge Webster's encyclopedic unabridged dictionary that's about this thick, circa 1996, and this is what it says. A comprehensive conception or image of the universe and of humanity's relationship to it. This is what Jesus has been preaching. 
not life hacks, not the seven habits of highly effective people. Jesus has been giving the disciples a crash course in worldview. He's been reframing for them, for us, what life is, what life means, what it's all about. Jesus redefines truth. In fact, have you noticed that the word truth appears many times in this gospel? In fact, it appears more than 50 times. 52 is how many I counted. Jesus turns the disciples' conception of truth upside down, transforming how we view the universe and our relationship to it. By the way, this is not about Jesus speaking his truth, as if truth is merely a personal expression of reality, and Jesus is simply offering us one more perspective. Jesus does not purport to speak his truth. What he actually says is, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus, as the divine Son of God, is the one who has the right to define truth. What life is all about. And so it's no surprise that in the final moments before his arrest and crucifixion, he reaches the climax of redefining truth for the disciples in reframing their worldview. This is exactly what we find today as we turn to John 17. I invite you as you turn there to take the sermon outlines from your bulletins. If you did not receive one of these, just raise your hand and John will make sure that you get it. Now, here is what is interesting about this final chapter before Christ's arrest. Jesus' final instruction on worldview takes the form of a prayer. We already looked at the first five verses of this prayer during our communion meditation, but look at verse 1 again. It says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Jesus chooses to use these final moments with his disciples to pray. That may seem a little strange to us especially in a culture where prayer is not highly valued. Even in the Christian subculture, prayer is too often seen as something you do at church or only in extreme circumstances or maybe just before Thanksgiving dinner. But if you've tracked with Jesus throughout the Gospels, you know that prayer is priority for him. He prioritized time with the Father. And so it should be no surprise that this pivotal moment, Jesus prays. But what is great about prayer is that it reveals what is most important to a person, doesn't it? Have you ever listened to the prayers of a child? Sometimes our expectations of children are too low. And when they pray, they catch us off guard. We didn't even know that they knew that was going on. We didn't know they were even thinking about it. But when they pray, all of a sudden we're, we, we get a window into their soul and what's heavy on their hearts. Children pray not generic prayers, they pray from their hearts. It's awesome to be able to hear what God puts on the hearts of kids. But what they pray reveals to us what's going on inside, what they care about. I've seen the same kinds of prayers from adults who are going through deep waters, like the desperate prayer of a parent for a child who is in harm's way. That's when we pray authentically, not a now I lay me down to sleep kind of prayer, but God, I need you now kind of prayer. Any of you see the movie Breakthrough? How many of you have seen that? Anyone out there? Okay, one, two, buckle my shoe. Not, not enough. Breakthrough is a Christian-based movie, but it tells a powerful story of a, of a boy who's playing on ice and falls through. And really the big part of the movie is where the mother is praying over her son as he is lifeless there on that hospital bed. You can bet that she's not praying, oh God, please help my son and please help my bank account to be bigger and for everyone to be happier. That's not what she's praying. She's crying out to God from the bottom of her soul, from the depths of her heart. God, I need you now. You want to know what happens? You'll have to watch the movie. (laughs) But my point is this. If you want to know what's important to Jesus, you need only listen to what it is that Jesus prays for his disciples. I really appreciate the way that renowned Bible scholar Leon Morris 
introduces this prayer in his commentary. He writes, No attempt to describe the prayer can give a just idea of its sublimity, its pathos, its touching yet exalted character, its tone at once of tenderness and triumphant expectation. The last words are important. We so, so often understand this prayer as though it were rather gloomy. It is not. It is uttered by one who has just affirmed that he has overcome the world. John 16, verse 33. And it starts from this conviction. Jesus is looking forward to the cross, but in a mood of hope and joy, not one of despondency. The prayer marks the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, but it looks forward to the ongoing work that would now be the responsibility, first of the immediate disciples, and then of those who would later believe through them. Jesus prays for them all. Which points, uh, brings us to the first question that we ask of this text. Why? Why does Jesus pray, pray specifically for this ragtag group of disciples? And it's because they believe in Christ. Look at verses 6 through 8. It says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you've given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. They believed. Many rejected Jesus, but these men received him and believed him because they were given to him by the Father. Notice these verses emphasize both God's sovereign call and his disciples' response of faith. Notice also that faith and obedience are not set at odds here. We too often see this in theology. It's faith versus works. But not in Jesus' prayer. Faith and obedience go together. They obeyed the word of God spoken by Jesus, verse 6, which flows from the fact that they believed Jesus was sent from God, verse 8. Obedience to God's word flows naturally from faith in the word. That is Jesus Christ. Notice one other thing about faith here. Faith is not some wishy-washy, wishful thinking. And this is something we really need to challenge because our, our culture says, well, you just got to take it on faith. As if it's something that's wishy-washy, that you're not sure about. You see the word that's used to describe faith here? Do you see it? Certain. It's certainty. It's not wishy-washy. They knew with certainty Jesus' divine origin. What is revealed in the first eight verses of this chapter is that contrary to popular opinion, it does matter what you believe about Jesus. Jesus clarifies from the start that his prayer is for those who will believe in him. It is not for those who believe in a higher power. It is not for those who are monotheistic. It is not for those who think Jesus was a good man or maybe even a prophet of God. It is for those who accept Jesus' words about himself that he is Jesus, Messiah, God's Son, Savior. It is Christ and Christ alone who serves as the non-negotiable prerequisite for belonging to God. This is the next part of the motivation behind Christ's prayer. Because they belong to the Father. Look at verses 9 and 10. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. But for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. Now, we've already read John 3.16, right? That's been a while ago. But we know God cares about the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God cares about the world. He loves the world. But he has a special concern and love. For those who belong to him through faith in his son, and so that is why Jesus is praying particularly for them. It is important to see, however, not just what Jesus says about the disciples, but what he says about himself. In fact, in verse 10, he makes a really profound statement, and maybe you didn't catch it at first. I'll admit, I didn't catch it at first either, but look at verse 10 once again. He says, all I have is yours, and all you have is mine. Now, here's the thing. All of us could say the first part. I mean, it's possible, right, that I could say, God, all I have is yours. The second part, 
none of us can say, unless we are also God. And I appreciate this point that's brought out by the great reformer Martin Luther. He says this, no creature can say with reference to God. But that's really the point, isn't it? Jesus is no creature. He is God. He is not created. And so he says, all I have is yours and all you have is mine because we are one. He is once again magnifying his own divinity, his oneness with the Father. Why does Jesus pray for the disciples? Because they believe in him as the divine son of God and as a result, they belong to God. But the reason Jesus prays for his disciples is because while he returns to the Father, they are still in the world. Look at the first half of verse 11. He says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Jesus knows that it will not be easy for his followers in this world, especially in view of his soon and coming arrest and death. So Jesus prays for us because we're still living in a world which is in opposition to the kingdom of God where our allegiance truly belongs. And this brings us to the content of Jesus' prayer, the, the what. What does he pray for? First of all, he prays for our unity, that we would be one in heart and mind. Look again at verse 11. He says, I'll remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. The disciples are living in a world which despises them and their message. Not only this, but the evil one is actively seeking to attack them and destroy their work in this environment. It is essential that the disciples remain united. The power of Christian unity for the cause of Christ is immeasurable. And as I make that statement, I need to pause and just say, one month from today, first Sunday in August, we are going to have a demonstration of unity before this community. As many churches, gospel preaching churches like us here in the city of Renton will gather together at Lake Boren for worship in the park. It's 5 p.m. next Sunday, uh, excuse me, August 4th, that Sunday night at 5 p.m. Uh, there's no child care because it's going to be a short service and it's going to be families worshiping together followed by a free barbecue. Believers here at Redden Bible Church, will you make that a priority to come out and let that be an expression to our community that there is not one church in the city of Renton, or I should say there is only one church in the city of Renton, and that is the Church of Christ, and we all are members of it, whether we're here or at the Nazarene Church or at Valley Church or at Sunset or Harambe or Highlands Community. We're all members of one church, and that is Christ Church, and what an awesome opportunity we'll have one month from now to display that before this community. Notice Jesus' prayer is that the disciples would be one as we are one. I return to Leon Morris's commentary where he says, It is the divine unity of love that is referred to. All wills bowing in the same direction, all affections burning with the same flame, all aims directed to the same end. One blessed harmony of love. Enthusiasts for the ecumenical movement, let me just make a brief explanation here that we do not consider our group an ecumenical group. Ecumenical often refers to all religions coming together and being one. Those who are outside of Christ, those who are in Christ. We're not an ecumenical group. That's why we call ourselves the Renton Gospel Network. What unites us is our belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ because we believe that is what saves. And so that's what unites us. So with that in mind, I continue reading. Enthusiasts for the ecumenical movement sometimes speak as though the reunion of Christendom would be the answer to Jesus' prayer. While it is true that unity of organization can be an impressive witness to unity of spirit, yet as such it is merely outward. It is not this that is in mind here, but something much more difficult, a unity of heart and mind and will. It is well that we work to bring the sundered denominations together, but it is better to look for a grander unity than that, and it is this grander unity for which 
Jesus prays. What is this grander unity? It is the intimate, profound unity of the Godhead reflected all throughout Jesus' ministry in his persistent dependence upon the Father. Jesus is here inviting the disciples into this intimate relationship of the Godhead, saying, you are part of the family. But do you see the adjective Jesus uses to describe Father here? Do you see it? What is it? Holy. I love it. We sang, we sang that many times in our songs this morning. Holy. You alone are holy. Father, holy Father. Now, we like the word Father, right? In our day and age, we love to have that kind of warm, fuzzy feeling toward God. Holy is not quite as popular across the board. We could do without the holy part. That seems like God judges, like God is, is distinct from us, because our culture says we're all gods. But Jesus says, holy, Father. He says, Jesus says, God is set apart. Holy, Father, is difficult to grasp. It is not merely that God is Father, a warm, welcoming source of affection, nor is it that God is merely holy, a transcendent, awe-inspiring source of judgment. He is a holy Father. He is imminent and transcendent. He is welcoming and judging. He is affectionate. And he is awesome. And Jesus' prayer to the Holy Father is that the disciples would experience oneness with each other through their oneness with him, which brings up the second purpose listed here, that they might have joy, life to the full. Let's read verses 12 through 13. Jesus says, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. The full measure. Is that remind you of John 10:10, 10, 10, where Jesus says, I've come that they might have life and life to the full. Here Jesus is telling the disciples, he's going their Lord is going to be crucified. The one who has protected them, cared for them, is leaving. He knows that the disciples face a tough road ahead. Funny, isn't it? Jesus is the one about to go through the most painful, unthinkable death. And yet he is praying for his disciples' encouragement, comfort, and joy. Which raises the question, how is joy even a possibility in view of what is about to happen? It is because Jesus' worldview doesn't depend upon earthly pleasure and recognition, but upon divine pleasure and the recognition of God. It is knowing God and doing his will that is most important. Haven't we seen this all throughout the gospel of John? And it reaches a high point here. He says, God, I've completed the work you've given me to do. This is what drives Jesus. And Jesus prays that the disciples might see through the grief of Jesus' departure to the joy of what it means for them, for the world, a world that doesn't much care for them, according to verses 14 and 15. Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. The third part of Jesus' prayer is for protection as they continue in the world. The world is a very significant topic in John 17. We don't catch this just from reading the text. You've got to look at the stats, look at the numbers. The word world occurs 14 times in this one chapter. That's a lot. Now, you may remember we talked about John 15, 19 not too long ago, where in one verse the world occurs five times. But here in this chapter, I believe this is probably the chapter that has the word world more times than any other chapter in the entire Bible. Honestly, I'm not sure we relate super well to Jesus' attitude toward the world. In fact, to hear Christians talk about worldliness almost seems archaic, outdated, a little too much like the church lady wagging her finger. Don't be worldly. But listen, Jesus' focus on the world in John 17 is not 
as a playground that we get to enjoy until He comes again, but as a system that stands in opposition to the kingdom of God. He warns us as His disciples about the fact that the world hated Him and accordingly will hate those who follow in His footsteps. Why? Because Jesus' worldview stands in stark contrast to the worldviews that are popular in our culture today. The dichotomy between the world and the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ is becoming more clear with every passing day. It is becoming increasingly unpopular to hold to this book as truth. It is for this reason that Jesus' final emphasis in this prayer for His disciples lands on sanctification set apart for God. This is what sanctify means, and this is what Jesus prays in verses 17 through 19. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Sanctify isn't a word that we use in everyday speech. We do use similar words. For example, we call this area that we're sitting in right now the sanctuary. It is a holy place, a place set apart for the gathering of God's people for worship. When Jesus calls us to be sanctified in this world, He's calling us to be set apart for special use, for God's purposes. Sin, selfishness, worldliness renders us unavailable to God for His eternal purposes. Interestingly, Jesus says that they are sanctified by the truth. This in and of itself stands in sharp contrast to a world that says there is no truth. And finally, Jesus reveals the foundation of that truth for His disciples. What is the foundation of that truth? What is the basis? It is the Word of God. Verse 17, your word is truth. The statements Jesus makes here are in extreme opposition to the philosophy of our world. This world says, if it feels good, do it. Jesus says, if it aligns with His Word, do it. The world says sin is no big deal. Sexual immorality is no big deal. Fudging on the truth when it's expedient is no big deal. Using the Lord's name in vain is no big deal. Putting others in their place is no big deal. Basically, sin is no big deal, says our world. Have you noticed that we now have the Ten Commandments hanging in the foyer? Have you seen that? Now, we weren't trying to make some kind of statement, per se. They were actually given to us. And so I saw a bare spot on the wall, and I, I hung them there. But they're a good reminder that though we live in this world, we do not live in accordance with the values of this world. God's Word instructs us on how to live by His rule to be holy, to be sanctified, set apart, or as Jesus says, in the world, not of the world. There are two extremes we can go to when it comes to the world. One is to be out of the world. In other words, basically disengaged. Over here on this extreme, it's to become a hermit. On the other end of the spectrum is to be of the world, to basically act as though this world is our home. In this extreme, when God's law conflicts with the world's values, we bend it, we stretch it, we water it down to make it fit. God's word becomes subject to the world. Which of these extremes, the hermit or the one who feels like they're at home in the world, which of these two extremes do you feel like we are most vulnerable to? I'll be honest, my temptation is over here. In fact, I think this is true of most of us. We are all susceptible to the temptation to let worldly pursuits move, uh, marginalize kingdom pursuits, kingdom values. It was true of the first disciples there in the upper room. Do you want proof that they were, they were drawn to the worldly side of things? Look at Judas there in the upper room leaving so that he can go betray Jesus for what? For some money? Look at Peter. Peter, who's so zealous for Jesus that he cuts off the servant of the high priest's ear. That's how much I love you, Jesus. And just moments later, three times in a row, he denies even knowing him. I wonder what his motive was. Was it so that he'd fit in? 
Did he feel out of place in the world and he wanted others to affirm him, peer affirmation? Maybe he was afraid of facing the same fate as Jesus. How about you and me? Are we ever tempted to fudge on our values to be accepted by the world? Are we ever more concerned about how we appear on social media or what our buddies think of us than we are about bringing honor and glory to God? Jesus' prayer sets the standard, and it's a standard in John 17 that puts the glory of God and our relationship with God above everything else. It's a prayer that calls us to be united in purpose, to pursue joy in Christ, to rest in his protection, and to pursue holiness by the power of his indwelling spirit. We need Jesus' prayer today just as much as the first disciples did, and that's why we are here why we set apart every Sunday to gather with God's people. It's so that we can acknowledge that God is our king. Six days we work. Six days we're entangled with activity and pursuing sometimes worldly things. We set apart this time to be reminded that we belong to him and so that as we leave this place that these next six days we can remember who we are to whom we belong, and what we're living for. Jesus prays for his disciples. Ultimately, he's praying for you and me. Now, next week, we're going to hit the high point because it is going to be specifically his prayer, not even just for those disciples, but his prayer specifically for those who would believe in them through him, believe in him through them. Do you know who that is? Us. John 17, 20 to 26. I'm looking forward to diving into that rich word. And by the way, it'll be my privilege on August 4th to also preach from that text for our worship in the park service. But you know what, believers? We need Jesus' prayer today just as much as the first disciples did. And that's why we are here, why we set apart every Sunday to gather with God's people so that we can remember who we are acknowledging God as our king, growing in our walk with Jesus, and working together to further the eternal kingdom of the living God. By God's grace, brother and si brothers and sisters, may we learn more and more to be in the world, but not of it. Let's pray. And God, we thank you so much for the richness of your word, for the blessing of being called sons and daughters of God, God, we confess that sometimes we forget who we are. Sometimes we allow worldly pursuits to let us marginalize your kingdom and our relationship with you. But God, we need you. We need your word to guide us, to instruct us in truth. And we need your people to encourage us and spur us on to faith and good deeds. God, help us to be the people you've called us to be, to remember that just like those first disciples, we have been given a mission. And especially this next week, as we minister to kids in our community, God, would you work in and through us? Would you keep us all safe? Would you help us to be wonderful witnesses of your love to these kids and their parents? And God, would you further your kingdom through us? We pray it all in Christ's precious name. Amen.